it's time for our daily trip into weather geekdom. Welcome back, everyone, to Weather for Weather Geeks on this Tuesday evening, the first full day of spring today was a winter despite some increase in cloudiness this afternoon this was still a very nice day after the cold start temperatures got into the mid 50s as expected this afternoon quick time lapse from our columbiana camera shows the crystal clear skies from this morning replaced by a deck of those high and middle level clouds that just kind of made for a milky sky at times during the second half of the day today but temperature wise again it was a big improvement over where we've been over the last few days. All right, in the state of Ohio, Severe Weather Awareness Week rolls on. If you follow a lot of weather accounts uh, on Facebook or social media in Ohio, whether it be the Cleveland National Weather Service Office, uh, the Pittsburgh National Weather Service Office, the Wilmington, Ohio National Weather Service Office, other TV meteorologists, no doubt you've heard uh, about Severe Weather Awareness Week. It's usually around this time of the year in Ohio, Pennsylvania. It's typically in April. In our part of Ohio and Western PA, typically our thunderstorm days start ramping up later in the spring. We don't see a lot of thunderstorm activity yet in March, but later in April, and especially during the second half of May and into June, that's when our thunderstorm days really ramp up, reaching a crescendo during early to mid-summer, and then the number of days with thunderstorms tend to decrease uh, as we go towards the second half of the summer and right around Back to school time, Canfield Fair time. Of course, last year uh, during the Canfield Fair, we had a an EF one uh, EF zero tornado uh, with hellacious flooding uh, in uh, in Mahoning County in early September. But typically, that's the time of the year that things are getting a little bit quieter. Uh, yesterday, I talked about what to do, what we recommend you do if you live in an apartment building and you don't have a, a basement, a home with a basement. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about what if you're in your car and, hey, there's a tornado over there. Uh, hopefully you never, ever find yourself in this situation, but it's a good question. What do you do? And it, like a lot of things, it kind of depends on the situation. If you're in a on a country road or there's not a lot of traffic around and you can maneuver to safety, taking a, a right angle away from the tornado and the eventual path of a tornado, that's uh, usually your best bet. But a lot of times, hey, we're stuck in traffic or we're, you know, we're on 224 in Boardman or something like that, and we can't just uh, quickly get away. Best thing to do is actually get out of your car. Now, it's it's the better of all bad choices. None of these choices are great, but probably your best choice is to actually get out of your vehicle, lie flat in a in a, as low a spot as you can, usually a ditch, something like that. Uh, cover your head. That's the most important thing to protect yourself the best you can from flying debris. What we don't want you to do is seek shelter under an overpass. Um, that's usually a really bad idea. There was, you know, a viral one of the first viral internet videos, at least related to the weather that I can remember, uh, dates back to the 1990s, I believe, uh, where some people were seeking shelter from a tornado under an overpass. The tornado went right over the bridge. They survived, but they were very, very lucky. And that uh, that tornado, while dramatic, or that video, I should say, while dramatic and everything, uh, gave people the wrong idea because actually the wind speeds are going to increase in that little space underneath a, a bridge or an overpass, and you certainly don't want to be where it's actually even windier in the event of a tornado. So we don't want you to seek shelter under an overpass or a bridge. Uh, best thing to do: get out of your car and protect your head. All right, nothing like that coming anytime real soon. What is coming? Thickening clouds this evening and a little bit, and I mean a little bit, of wet weather later on tonight into tomorrow. But this precipitation is going to run into a pretty dry air mass that's overhead. Our dew points locally are in the single digits and teens, so as a lot of this pushes in, it's going to get eaten up by the drier air. I can't rule out a sprinkle or a shower later on tonight into our uh, our Wednesday, but a lot of Wednesday just kind of pretty cloudy and uneventful. Mild. We'll get into the 50s. Now the rain pushes in tomorrow night. This will be more legitimate rain. Even some bouts of heavier rain will be a possibility tomorrow night, heading into at least the first half of the day Thursday. There could be a rumble of thunder in the mix as well, and we're going to stay pretty unsettled through a good chunk of Thursday, especially the first half of the day. The rain probably tries to let up some later in the day, and then we'll see what happens with this front. It's a tricky forecast Thursday night into Friday. Right now, uh, the modeling would suggest, a lot of the modeling, including what I'm showing you here, would suggest this front stalls far enough to the south on Friday that we actually get in on some drier air. It may be a halfway decent day on Friday, with rain a little more likely down towards Interstate 70 in central Ohio and points south. Now, if this front were to stall a little bit farther to the north, that would introduce higher chances of rain back into our forecast for Friday. But either way, I do think the rain's going to return by Friday night and into Saturday, another unsettled period is ahead. I think this will be up to a couple of inches worth of rain. I think the European's a little bit too high, advertising two and a half inches or so. I think the GFS is a little bit closer to reality, but even that is an inch and three quarters to two inches worth of rain. Thankfully, not all coming at once, but two main rounds, Wednesday night into Thursday, 
and then Friday night and heading into the day on Saturday. Flooding concerns probably a little bit higher in southern Ohio, parts of western Ohio as well. All right, let's look ahead to the longer range. First things first, let's talk about April. This was the April Outlook issued by the Climate Prediction Center last Friday. This is the first opportunity I've had to kind of talk about this. It's one of the rare instances that I'm pretty skeptical of a Climate uh, Prediction Center long-range forecast. A lot of the modeling goes against this idea that warmer than average temperatures would be favored in the eastern U.S. If the trends were to continue, I would expect a revision to this forecast at the end of this month to in introduce more blues in the northern tier and get rid of some of the oranges across the Great Lakes. Now, does April look harshly cold or something like that? Not necessarily, no, but I don't see a lot of model evidence on any suite of modeling that would suggest that April is likely to be, by any significant margin, warmer than the average. I would put my money on it actually being a little bit cooler than the average, at least. Now, let's talk about the summer. I put this on social earlier, but yeah, this complicated graph uh, needs some explanation. Uh, basically, we've been in La Nina for three straight years, which is pretty rare. Usually, it's kind of two and out. Two straight El Ninos, two straight La Ninas, and then it flips. Uh, it's not very often that we have three straight La Ninas or El Ninos. Uh, we're coming out of La Nina, and we're going probably into El Nino this summer. Um, the modeling is starting to coalesce around the idea that El Nino is probably going to come on pretty fast this summer, maybe even establishing itself by June or into July. Um, and the question is, what, what kind of bearing will that have on our summer weather? Uh, all these dots over here on this side, uh, the greens are La Nina years. The ones I have circled in the orange and red, and I have red circles around them, those are El Nino years during the summertime. And this quadrant over here, dry and cool. This quadrant, cool and wet. This one, warm and wet, and this one is warm and dry. Uh, there's a distribution here, but when you fo focus on the, the circled areas, the El Ninos, you notice the drier circles outnumber the wetter circles down here in the kind of cool half of the graph, the bottom half of the graph. In the warmer half of the graph, the upper level uh, part of the graph, again, the drier number, uh, the drier circles outnumber the wetter circles. So if El Nino is to come on this summer, it would argue uh, this graph, uh, you know, recent history and not even, you know, several decades in the past, th the history would argue for it being a drier than average summer and perhaps a cooler than average summer, although the temperature forecast, I think, is would be a lower confidence thing than the precipitation forecast. There's a little more of a signal when El Nino comes on in the summer seasons. That's the way things kind of are shaping up here. We're just barely into spring, so there's plenty of time to analyze new data and, and figure out if El Nino is going to come on this summer, if it's going to wait till the fall, but the trends have definitely been sooner on a lot of the long lead modeling, and so maybe we have a drier than average summer ahead of us. We'll talk more about the longer range, including the April forecast and beyond, later this week and next week on Weather for Weather Geeks. Thanks for watching on this Tuesday evening. I'll have an update on the short-term forecast tomorrow evening on the Valley's most in-depth weather forecast.